Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things.
Scripture readings are offering little your gift. Jesus, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts in the treasury. And he saw a young a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they out of their surplus put in offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. I truly believe that when we give pure and honest heart that God will truly bless us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for the privilege of being in your house, taking the emblems, and now that we give back a portion of what is truly yours. And yes, bless it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We see that some people had just quit working altogether. 
he wrote them that Jesus was coming back. So they got all excited and, and thought, well, if Jesus is coming back, I'm just going to sit here and wait on him. And so they just kind of quit working. They quit working their land. They quit doing their jobs. And all of a sudden, now you have people who were mooching off the church because the people who weren't working didn't have any income coming in. And so they started coming to the church. Well, we don't have anything to eat. Well, why aren't you going to work? Well, we're waiting on Jesus. He's coming. He'll be here soon. We're, we're waiting on him. And, and, you know, we've been sitting out here waiting on him all this time. And they're like, well, you know, Paul, hey, you, you told everybody that this was happening. And now this is kind of your fault. You, you need to fix this. So Paul starts telling them, hey, you know, you don't just sit and, and sit on your laurels. You need to work. You know, just because you're you're waiting on Jesus doesn't mean that you can just sit around. So the resources of the church were being taken away, and it was starting to become an issue within the church. So what do we do now that Jesus has taken so long to return? That was 2,000 years ago. It seems like, uh oh, wait a minute, there's an issue here. They were expecting him the next day. You know, they were excited. He's coming back. And, and they were out, you know, trying to hurry and rush this thing along. And now it's been 2,000 years later. So what do we do? It's really kind of an issue today, just as much as it was in the first century, and at least in my opinion. These folks thought they were ready. Let's get going. They were sincere in that they wanted Jesus to come quickly. But he didn't come. He just kept taking his time. Some had even thought that maybe Jesus had already come and they missed the boat. And they just completely missed it. But he's already here. And he didn't take us with him. No. We're going to know when he comes. It's going to be glorious. Amen? Amen. Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're just going to read a few verses and kind of see what's going on. And get an idea here where we're going. It says, Now, we request that you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that are gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit, or a messenger, or a letter as if from us. To effect that, the day of the Lord has come. He's not been here already. Don't worry about that, right? Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know that what restrains him now, so that it is his time, and he will be revealed. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. That's in fact. It was already started in that day. That mystery had already been at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until it is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed in whom the Lord will stay with the breath with the breath of his mouth, or say with the breath of his excuse me, slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, that is, the one in whom, uh, whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. And all power and signs and false wonders and all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false 
Well, we have a lot of that going on in our world today, you know. Verse 12, in order that they may be judged whom did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Now, we have some details here that we can kind of look at. The Lord is not going to actually come back until the apostasy comes. It says that in verse 3. This gives us the title of the guy that we need to be looking for, the man of lawlessness. You keep hearing this word, Antichrist. No, that's not what we're looking for. The Antichrist is what's described in 2 John. Okay? And he was already in that the spirit of Antichrist had already been alive and well in the first century as well. So, who is this lawless one? Verse 7 tells us that the mystery of the lawless one is already at work. That lawlessness is there. It's going. So it's already been 2,000 years in the works. We've had many so-called Antichrists, but it isn't his name. It is the man of lawlessness that we've been looking for. Many have said that it might be the Pope that fits this mold. He sits on God's throne and calls himself God on earth. There's some new revelation that came out from the Pope recently. Did y'all hear? You no longer need to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. Really? Thank you, Mr. Pope. I appreciate you giving us that revelation. I don't know where you get that stuff from. Some of you call Nero, Domitian, many other in the lawless one, even Hitler, Stalin, Mao of China, Saddam Hussein, maybe. Right? We just had him not too long ago. There's an Imam of Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini, could be the one as well. I've actually heard, <laughs> it was actually kind of comical, Barack Hussein Obama may be the lawless one. It's comical that every generation thinks that they have the guy. My generation in the 80s, it was Gorbachev, remember? He had that scar there, that birthmark on his head, and they kept saying it was the bear of the eagle. Here we go. Jesus is coming. Russia and America, we're going at it. Right? Y'all remember that? I remember it well. Then Rocky came out and beat down the Russians, and it was all over. We never heard any more of that stuff. <laughs> He fixed his wagon real good. But Jesus is coming back. And we need to get ready. See, that's the whole point of the letter. We're, we're all worried about who this guy is. When we really need to be worried about what we have to do to get ready. That's what's important, guys. That's what's important. The whole point of the letter is, hey, you got to watch out for this guy. But get ready. It is so important that we just forget about all the frivolous stuff and we get ourselves prepared for the coming of the Lord. We who are the church have a job to do. It is our job to get people ready. I do want to take a moment to brag a little bit about what we've been doing here lately. We've been working hard at Scottsville Christian Church. Did y'all know that last Sunday night we had 17 people over here in the gym? We had seven kids and 10 adults who were all over here working to serve the children. Right? We're working. We're doing the things that we're called to do. We had one couple bring, go out of their way and bring some of their neighbor kids. We had another family that invited some of their family and we had four kids come out of the woodwork we had never seen before. 
and they can't be here this week because they're on vacation, but we have actually told them that we will extend center shot an extra couple of weeks to make sure that those kids get all of the effective center shot. I'm willing to do that for them. Why? Because we want to minister to these kids. If they can't be here tonight, we'll let them come next week and we'll start back over again, right? Our goal is to minister to the children, to bring God to those who need it the most. This is where, oh, this is great. Presley, a uh, little girl who comes, she just loves coming to Center Shot. She's one of our slingshotters. And she could get that bow back, but she can't quite hold it all the way. And we got it tuned all the way down for her. And she could hold it, she could get it back, but she can't quite hold it. So she's not quite able to shoot yet. She's 10, right? 10? And just the cutest little thing, but they're a brother and sister. They're named Elvis and Presley. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as cute as can be. <laughs> oh, Randy's got his, what do you say, Randy? Elvis Presley is in the building. Elvis Presley is in the building. <laughs> there we go. So she comes up to me after center shot last week and she said, I, I want to look at, at your church page. I want to watch what you do. And I'm going to put a note on your YouTube. And I was like, really, what are you going to put on there? And she says, this is where I come to learn about God. She said, I want it right on there so the whole world knows this is where I come to learn about God. That's what makes it all work. Another couple, you know, just touched me this last week, and I started, I went down and, and did a little visit, and then I saw that we had somebody in need that was hurting, and she was just kind of you know, feeling a little bit depressed because the fall was coming and everything should look pretty, and, and things were just kind of browning out in her yard, and, you know, the grass wasn't and pretty anymore and the flowers weren't there and she said so I get on the internet and I put on our Facebook page hey folks we need some some donations some flowers and and some things to put out a, a flower bed for for Miss Pat and we had donations just coming and we got our beautiful flower bed set up we had straw bales and little you know uh, the little scarecrows set up and it was so cute. She's so funny. And she says, I'm going to name the scarecrows Jimmy and Bobby. And she made me tie their hands. She made me tie their hands together so they'd be holding hands. <laughs> uh, but you can just see the tears in her eyes. See, that's the love of God. That's what the church is supposed to be. We are supposed to be doing these things for the love of God. It is the church that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be working to minister to the least of God's children, to the most of God's children. I mean, Paul, as he says here, look at verse 13. He says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this that He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions in which we taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. He said, I give thanks to God for you all. I pray for you all more than you might know. See, God has given us over to the love of those in the church. Thank the Lord that He does that. 
It's an amazing thing when God starts to touch the church. Paul made a habit of loving the church. He wrote that we were to live godly lives. And live lives that are worthy of God. I want to look at the text in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. From a historical understanding of the culture to get what Paul is telling these folks. He's looking at the wedding. It's a complicated event in the first century. And if you think that our wedding's now bad, y'all haven't seen anything. So I wanted to kind of talk about the wedding ceremony. We're going to first talk about the dowry. The dowry. Sadly, the dowry was basically the price of a slave. The father would literally be losing a day wager, right? And the loss of his daughter. Many say different prices, but the price of a slave is what? Or the pieces of silver. Some all the way up to 50, but... Uh, oh, sorry. What's the significance of the 30 pieces of silver? We're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to see because it's going to come back again, right? We're going to remember that. It's always got to be in our mind. Some of the wealthy might have been up to 50, but it's something that would be worked out by the parents. It was actually rare that the daughter had any say in the choice of the husband. There might have been an engagement ceremony that would have been called for, and it constitutes marriage, because literally to stop a, a, an engagement, you'd have to get a certificate of divorce. Most people don't know that. So if you were engaged, you literally had to get divorced to be able to, to break off an engagement. It was that, that serious. It wasn't funny business at all. You couldn't just go say, well, I'm going to go get engaged and then get the ring and look at the ring for a little while and say, oh, well, I don't like this guy anymore. He didn't give me a big enough ring. It didn't work out. Like you had to get a divorce. The groom would then set a time to return for the wedding. And he would head off to prepare the home for their future. It sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? We've seen this in some parables, haven't we? He's done this. He'll actually uh, be gone for quite a while. He'll prepare the home. The bride and him and the family will have begun the preparation for the wedding at that point. The wedding clothes would be bleached in vats uh, that would actually literally take days to do. Uh, every person who was invited would have wedding garments and they would be white. Now we just use the, the white dress, right? That the bride gets the white. But in their day, everybody had a white garment. Okay. Remember the parable where the guy was invited in and, and they had the wedding garments ready and the guy came in without the wedding garments and he was ejected? Right? Because he, if you weren't invited, you didn't have a wedding garments. Ready. There was only so many that were going to be allowed. Then there would be the feast. Only the bride and, uh, and the mother and, and the family would begin to prepare this idea of the, the feast. The wine would be prepared in advance. Uh, there would be a watchman that would actually be uh, set out at the approximate time. Uh, if y'all heard of that watchman thing, uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses say, you know, the watchman magazine that they send out and all. The watchtower, yeah. They would literally set somebody in a tower there and, and watch for the second coming or for the bridegroom coming back. Okay? There would, uh, at the time of the arrival, the groom would be placed in that, uh, there would be somebody in that watchtower, and the groom, as he was returning, there would be an alarm that would sound. The celebration would actually start, and it would be a parade. And people would join the groom as he was coming in, and it would be a big, ruckus celebration. Sounds a 
Amen. Hosanna! Hosanna! Sound familiar? Similar in events, huh? It's kind of interesting. This is where it gets hairy. The parade causes everyone to put their wedding robes on. The robes of white. They follow the groom into the place where the wedding would be held. And then the door is to be shut and no one else is allowed in to disturb the wedding service. If you are not ready, then you miss the wedding party. If you do not have your white robes, then you're asked to leave because you were not invited to the wedding party. The vows are done. The consummation takes place. Uh, not very church-like to talk about, but the, later the, the linens would be taken up as proof of the bride's purity, and they'd be stored away. The party is on at that point, and the food and the wine flows free. We've all read the Bible where it talks about the good wine being served first and the, the cheap wine, the mad dog and the booze horn come out after everybody gets stopped, right? <laughs> but Jesus served the best wine, so our wedding party is going to be a whole lot better. There ain't going to be no booze horn at our wedding. party rolls on. Sometimes a celebration wouldn't last one day, but days on end. A wedding would last weeks sometimes. It was a major celebration. Remember when they had events, the, the Hebrew people really had events. They, they would have week-long you know, celebrations of tabernacles and, and Passovers and different things. Well, the wedding was no different. So why does this all matter at all? I'm glad to ask. Because Jesus paid our dowry. The blood of the slave was purchased for 30 pieces of silver. That price of the slave. See, his blood was our dowry. It wasn't the bride that paid the dowry. It was the groom. Jesus made the arrangements to go and make a home in his father's house in heaven for us. And he has promised to return. Sadly, though, we don't know exactly when, but he has promised to return. So we know it is the truth. The church is his bride of Christ, right? We are responsible to wash our robes white and clean for the wedding party. How do we do that? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Sound familiar? We do that at our baptism. Jesus will return. And we must be watching. And we must be ready for when he returns because our robes must be white. And we have to get in that wedding party before those doors close. See, the parable of the ten virgins states that we should have our lamps trimmed and full of oil. And in the biblical times, that oil represented the Holy Spirit. Y'all know that. If you don't have the Holy Spirit ready when Jesus returns, then you've got to go elsewhere until you can get it. Once that door shuts, you're locked out. At the wedding, we must be pure and have forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2 38. Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you. In the name of Jesus the Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the oil. You must have your wick ready and your oil full with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness of sin and your white robes. It's all part of the wedding party, folks. <clears throat> we receive 
our host, the bridegroom. And the celebration at that point doesn't just last for a day or a week. It lasts forever. See, that's our way. That's the way that we can look forward to. The theme of Thessalonians is simple, church. Jesus is coming back, and we better be ready. This church had been taught so vividly that they had literally stopped working and taking care of their lands and their families because they just knew Jesus was ready to come back at any moment. They were ready. 2,000 years later, we still need to be ready when Jesus returns and the church can't stop getting people ready for the wedding. It's all important to us. It's everything to us. We're called to be the light of the world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them what Jesus had laid out for us in his word. Are our garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are we washed in the blood of the Lamb? If you're not, then you know that you need to be getting ready. And I beg that you start praying now. Today is the day. Start praying now. Ask God, what do we need to do? What do we need to get done? So that you can be prepared for your wedding. If today is your day, then I want you to come and walk that aisle as the bride. Right down that aisle. Guys, I know. It seems kind of kooky that a guy would be a bride, doesn't it? But it's what God has called us. Joanne, Randy, this morning, are you washing in your robes? Are you filling your lamps with the Lord? Is the Holy Spirit moving? Look at there. Right Everybody ready for when he does. Amen. 